A very warm welcome to all of you who are just uh, tuning in. My name is Barkhadat and I am your host for today. This is the fourth annual conference of Women Leaders in Global Health. It's an honor to be overseeing this all important and critical conversation because I think as all of us know, uh, this pandemic has only shown up uh, the deep fault line that exists when it comes to having a conversation at the intersection of gender and health. Not only do women make up the majority of the healthcare workforce, 70%, as we've been talking all day, they have also suffered a disproportionate amount of the responsibility, the suffering, the aftermath of this COVID-19 pandemic. And so it is time to raise that question that actually is the elephant in the room. If there were more women in leadership positions, whether in the healthcare sector or whether in our parliaments or whether in corporate India or whether in managerial positions in, let's say, hospitals, would our handling of crisis be different? Would the world be different? Would our handling of this COVID-19 pandemic be different? There's been a lot of focus, for example, on countries that are led by women. Has their response been different when we compare it to countries that have been led by men. I hope you all had a fruitful set of conversations at your breakout sessions. We focused on a lot of different issues, including what female leadership looks like and if there is indeed such a thing. Like I told you, um, and, and for some who may not know and are just tuning in, personally, um, I have been a journalist uh, for more than two decades. And in the last four months, I spent about 120 days traveling across India reporting on the COVID-19 pandemic from the north to the south, clocking about 24,000 kilometers. And uh, I do have some interesting questions on all of your behalves uh, to um, put before our very, very distinguished plenary today. Remember, the focus is on Asia. And talking about Asia, if I were to just give you a figure from South Asia, our part of the world, it would take 70 years to close the gender gap at the current pace. And if you looked at that through the filter of just economic participation, well, one guess, I was staggered by this figure, 257 years is what it would take to close the gender gap. There is, of course, no country in the world where men outnumber women in terms of not being paid for the work that they do. This is something we've been talking about uh, all day. And then, of course, uh, there is the fact that seven in 10 girls in homes in many of our countries in South Asia cannot even make an individual decision about visiting family and friends or even leaving the home, uh, forget when it comes to accessing healthcare. So at the plenary session today, uh, I think the fundamental question before us is this, what would policy look like if seen through a gendered lens? Would it look different or would it look like more of the same. And as I said, I have a very, very distinguished panel uh, joining me today. It is my pleasure to welcome them uh, one by one. Uh, we're joined by uh, Dr. Shireen Charmin Chaudhary, uh, who is the speaker of the House of Nation, the Jatiya Sansad in Bangladesh. Uh, not just the first woman to hold this leadership position in the Bangladesh parliament, but also the youngest uh, to do so. Uh, we're joined by the very brave and courageous Dr. Suraya Dali. Uh, she has had to fight tooth and nail uh, against the social and religious orthodoxy of her country. She has a very, very compelling story about how she got her Harvard degree. And she's here to tell us why a greater number of men infected with COVID in Afghanistan is not actually the good news that it sounds like. And finally, it is my great pleasure to welcome my fellow citizen from India, Dr. Poonam Khetrapal Singh, the Regional Director for Southeast Asia at the World Health Organization. Once again, uh, Poonam has uh, been a very senior bureaucrat and is the first woman uh, to hold this leadership position uh, at the WHO. And we were talking earlier in the day uh, for all our panelists who are just joining us about how Healthcare globally is really delivered by women, but led by men. All of you hold leadership positions, but you all know that you're the exception. You're not the norm. Uh, there are women in only 25% leadership positions when it comes to looking at health. And women are paid 28% less uh, than men. And there are many women, millions sometimes, who are not paid at all. So um, I'm going to start by asking all three of you the same question. Uh, and that question is this, do you think the decisions you take in crisis 
are different because you're female. And I'll start with you, Dr. Chaudhary, Dr. Shireen Chaudhary, if I may. Thank you very much, um, Barkhadar. Um, today I'm uh, very honored and uh, it's a very special pleasure for me to join this session um, of making policy with gender lens. And uh, this is organized by Women Lift Health. Um, this fourth annual Women Leaders Global Health uh, Conference and also for the opportunity to uh, engage in this very important conversation. Uh, Excellencies uh, and all the distinguished uh, speakers of the plenary panel, uh, very warm uh, greetings from Bangladesh Parliament. Yes, um, I feel that women leaders uh, do bring in very unique and uh, special uh, traits uh, in whatever uh, work. Um, empathy and women being more empathetic, they uh, shared that in their workplace and that makes a huge difference in the um, giving the health uh, service in the health sector. Women leaders as policy makers and their role uh, in legislating even in parliament or uh, in uh, adopting different uh, strategies, um, they are um, better listeners and more accommodative so they listen to the problems and the diverse views that are necessary uh, and particularly in a pandemic situation which uh, um, and emerging challenges and uh, the female leaders do have uh, a better ability to grasp and act with uh, the new uh, information and the data uh, that is generated uh, during this uh, particular uh, critical time. So we all know that uh, during pandemic, it is a difficult situation and particularly in the health sector. But the other reason why women relate better in having a better understanding about the critical problems of women who face uh, the problems in the health sector because it is always a disproportionate uh, burden on women. If we uh, look from the very life cycle, um, from the entire starting point, point as a girl child moving on to adolescence and then to womanhood, um, we see that um, it places a largely uneven and disproportionate burden on women in every sector because um, the socioeconomic uh, strata uh, through which they have to go. They have limited access and control over resources. They have less participation in the decision-making process, uh, the gender discrimination. Uh, all of these uh, contribute to a very uh, unequal situation for women. So women leaders uh, ha can relate better to the sufferings of women in the health sector and also if we look at the maternal health and the focus on uh, the maternal mortality and trying to prevent that on those issues women leaders adopt more um, important policies uh, which will help prevent uh, maternal mortalities uh, during covid time and also during uh, normal times so because of uh, the power and the ability to listen, accommodate, uh, and the empathetic um, and sensitivity that the health sector, as they do in other sectors, wherever they are working, they make a difference in adopting um, more responsive, gender responsive policies to handle um, uh, the situations which are faced by women. 
Okay, I'm just going to actually check. Yeah, there, there, there's all of you. Uh, and I was wondering, Dr. Chaudhary, if you were able to hear me because I wanted to interject and ask you to actually give us an example of uh, how you feel women are more empathetic, you know, because this is a, a, a generalization and a compliment that has some been paid to us and we pay ourselves so often. Uh, but, uh, but I wanted to, before you do that, welcome also to our conversation and to our plenary uh, at this moment, uh, Sanya Nishtar. Dr. Nishtar is the special assistant to the Prime Minister on uh, poverty alleviation and social safety in Pakistan. Welcome, Sanya, to this conversation. Pleasure to have you on board. Uh, let me take the same question, if I may, to Dr. Poonam Khetrapal. Uh, you know, the thing is that I'm sometimes a little nervous about uh, the compliments that, that we uh, accord to women based on our gender, uh, Poonam. Uh, because what happens is it also gives people the opportunity to generalize when they want to insult you or when they want to patronize you. Uh, I think let's be very specific. Uh, when we say policy is different through a female lens, can you share an example? For example, you're in this key role in the WHO, Dr. Poonam Khetrapal Singh. What do you think your gender brings to your response to this crisis that maybe a male counterpart or a male gaze would not have even noticed or seen? Thank you, Barkha, for this question. Um, first of all, I don't think that when women would be so different in their response to women leaders would be very different just because they're women. Though I do think that, yes, as a woman, what I what would be uppermost on my mind is to see that pregnant women are taken care of, which I did do in this crisis that reproductive health services are available to all because uh, childbirth doesn't stop in a crisis. These things carry on. And therefore, it is extremely important to ensure that, yes, we do have those facilities which are open and essential services which relate to reproductive health are available to women when they need them. That is one thing which I was very sure to ensure, not only in the country that I'm based, but across all countries. Secondly, I feel that immunization, which was greatly affected by the crisis, and all our estimates show us that all immunization services could not be carried on the way we carry them on during a normal situation. However, we did try to ensure that in certain countries, in certain settings, we could provide those services. And there were experiments to see if certain health centers could be designated for immunization so that mothers could feel confident taking their children to these centers without the fear of contracting disease. The third thing that came to my mind when this crisis broke out, and we, of course, it's a pandemic, which you've discussed the whole of this morning, which is of disproportionate pro uh, proportions to what any other pandemic has been before in our lifetime. And therefore, there were cases of uh, sexual violence, harassment, which came to our notice. There was zero tolerance for that. We tried to ensure that yes, women did feel safe in whichever environment they were working in. And that was the responsibility of those who were at the helm of affairs and be it the head of a hospital, be it somebody in a different setting to ensure that when women came, they felt safe and they could come there. As you mentioned yourself, 70% of the workforce in the health sector are women. Therefore, their safety and security was of paramount importance to us. Uh, it was important, therefore, also to involve women whenever we met to make it more inclusive, to hear what their views were, to see how we could build that into policy making so that when policy was made, their perspective was not left out. And that is something which was extremely important to give them that confidence that they could share their experiences, they could share their thoughts, they could, without any fear, tell us what was it, or even tell me personally, which many of them did, what was it that was really bothering them and how could we go out of our way 
to help them and to solve the crisis that they were in. I think these messages go very quickly. So when there is zero tolerance for this kind of behavior, even though you can't prevent it totally, I do feel that the percentage goes down and people do get the message that this is something which will not be tolerated. And I feel, therefore, that in this kind of environment, to include them, to have inclusive decision making, to have inclusive meetings where they're given a voice, where you hear them, and not only at the top, I think it is to go across all levels so that even somebody, a volunteer in the field, is free to share her views just as the head of a hospital or an institution. These are things I think which are important, which empower women, which embolden them, which make them think that yes, in a free environment, in a safe, secure environment, they can share their views. It may not be openly, sometimes it's really quietly and for that purpose. I also have an ombudsman in my office for the whole region who is a woman and who travels across these countries, even during the crisis, she traveled just to hear the different voices that were there so that we could then bring them to me. There are uh, many instances where we do have the heads of, of certain hospitals who are women who have firsthand experience of what is going on. So I do believe that when we are in a situation like that as a woman, this comes very naturally to a woman to think of pregnancies, to think of reproductive health, to think of a child's welfare, to think of a woman's welfare. These come naturally to her. And that's what happened, I think, in this crisis, as far as some countries okay. of my region were concerned. OK, thank you. Uh, thank you, Poonam. I, I do have a lot more questions, but we'll just go around the, uh, the panel once. Uh, let me go to Dr. Suraya now. Uh, uh, Suraya, uh, firstly, you know, there's a counterintuitive statistic that's emerging from Afghanistan, uh, which basically talks of how the number of men who are infected with COVID is more than 70 percent. This is much higher than the global average, which is about 50 percent or 53 percent. This is not good news for women. And this is a counterintuitive thing to say, because when you hear, oh, more women more men are getting infected with covid you think hey good news but in afghanistan and in many of our countries what it simply means is that women are not even being prioritized enough to get access to that test to basic health care thank you thank you very much for this wonderful opportunity greetings uh, colleagues um I am privileged to join you in this plenary. I see so many distinguished colleagues and uh, fellow leaders. Yes, the Ministry of Health data from Afghanistan shows that the number of cases, confirmed cases, disproportionately high, higher among men compared to women. 70% men and 30% women are confirmed out of the total number of confirmed cases. This shows access to testing, access to services, and overall the, the well-being and the socioeconomic well-being for men compared to women. In terms of uh, hospitalization, the figures are also very different. 68% um, of hospitalized uh, patients are men compared to 32% women. But if we look at the provinces, we can see the provinces that are further rural and remote, men have more access compared to women. And then in places like Herat, which is socioeconomically better off, the comparison is less. Um, so the, the, in general, uh, we see that men have twice more access to testing and twice more access to care. What does it tell us? Two things. From a demand side, geographical access, financial access, because for women to have access to testing and care means transportation costs, buying medicine, and it takes us right. to the issue of who is making the, those decisions and the quality of care. 
Women prefer, in a society like Afghanistan, women prefer to be diagnosed and treated by female healthcare providers. And that's, uh, uh, that's an important issue for women. From a supply side, right. female health from supply side, female healthcare providers are less, and they are uh, more uh, centered in the urban places. Quality of care also play a greater role. Remember that according to the World Health Organization report in 2016, worldwide, one in five mm -hmm. health facilities did not have sanitation and one in six health facilities did not have hygiene. So this is an important issue when it comes to infection prevention control and when it comes to attracting patients, including women, and keeping them in the, in the facility. And of course, health information systems from a sup supply side perspective that for both women and men, we have a huge underreporting and also we should acknowledge that the vital statistics administration is weak and it's not that powerful to capture a lot of data. So there's overall an under-reporting, uh, a chronic under-reporting uh, when it comes to uh, mortality and morbidity. So okay. uh, data also shows us that there's a positive correlation between women's participation in the workforce and COVID-19 mortality rate for women. Um, I think it leads us to structural inequalities between men and women, the gender inequalities and the social and cultural norms. With regards to who makes that decision at the household level. Right. And that so, decision maybe, takes us to who has the financial responsibility and the financial means uh, to do that. And, and let me also tell you that... Yeah. No, no. No, it, this is important. Security is a big issue in Afghanistan. Afghanistan is in conflict. We have, we have fighting going on in a number of places in the country. So there is mm -hmm. an active fighting, and that written access and coverage for healthcare. Remember, it was only a few months ago that we saw an attack in a maternity hospital in Kabul, where delivery room was attacked newborns were killed and mothers during labor were targeted. This was only a few months ago. We have also seen clinics and hospitals attacks attacked throughout the country. But then when you are in that context, then recruitment for yes. female and as well as for male is a big challenge, become a big challenge. Deployment become a big challenge. Keeping them in the and services has become a big challenge. Ma'am, if I may interject, because there's so much you've put on the table and I want to pick up everything one by one, you know, there are too, many different things there, the absence of hygiene, the absence of sanitation, the absence of, of safety, the absence of uh, access, enough female doctors. So I'm going to just uh, request you to pause there, get Dr. Nishtar in, and then we can do a deeper dive into the points that all of you uh, have so compellingly made. Uh, Sanya Nishtar, if I now may bring uh, you to comment on the same question. Is there such a thing as the female gaze? I think all three of our previous speakers have agreed that there is. But what we also find happens in leadership positions for women in the public space, for women uh, where, you know, who work closely with governments, is that they're required to show that they're tough. They're required to show that they're not soft. They're almost required to adapt to a kind of different version of themselves and they may have been in a more equal or level playing field. So let me ask you, in your experience in dealing with this COVID crisis, how much of your response has been from a place of being female? How much of policy uh, that you believe in has come from a place of being female? Well, that's a... Uh, um, you know because uh, I'm everything myself as a as a woman I mean I'm a I'm a professional in a workspace and that's how I've always um, that's how I've always thought of myself um, I know that there is a tendency uh, especially in you know in some cultures for some women to say that you know we, because we are women we need a seat at the table because we are women there has to be a Certain quota, but I've always thought otherwise. I've, I've, and I all, and I believe that women need to 
uh, be at the table because of who they are, not because you are doing them a favor and giving them a seat at, at the table because uh, because because they're female. But that's not what your question uh, was about, Barka. Uh, your question was about uh, what aspects of the response that I led during COVID had to do with my being uh, female. Before I explain uh, some aspects of that to you, uh, let me tell you what, what was it during COVID that I did. Um, mm -hmm. All of you on the table know me as a health person, but in the cabinet, uh, I have responsibility for social protection. Um, in this cabinet, I don't have responsibility for health. Uh, and I think that I was very privileged because during the COVID crisis, I had the responsibility for uh, for developing a social protection solution. Uh, and just to put things in context and in perspective, uh, in Pakistan, which is the fifth most populous country in the world, there are 24 million breadwinners and their dependents, which, um, which comes to about 100 million, over 100, uh, I beg your pardon, 160 million, which were life for whom will came to a standstill. Um, uh, those breadwinners really had no money to take back home. And I had the responsibility of putting cash into their hands. Uh, it was a right. very, very serious right. responsibility. Uh, so, so what aspects of my being a woman helped there? And I think that the first thing that helped was that uh, I, I, I'm used to multitask. Uh, and I think most women are used to multitasking and that really helped because I had to get approvals from the cabinet, I had to do the planning, I had to manage communications, I had to manage the opposition, I had to manage the media, I had to manage several operational teams, there were several things that had to be done at tandem and I think like all women I'm good at multitasking. Uh, when you ask men to do th things like this, they will say, okay, we will do this and then we will do the next and then we will do the next. So I think as women, we have a natural advantage. We, we manage homes and work lives and social our lives and everything together. So I think I had a natural advantage with multitasking. Secondly, right. when you're a woman and you get to, uh, when you're, as a woman, when you get to a decision-making role, You've broken many glass ceilings, you've taken many risks, you, you know how to operate in a complex environment. So your risk-taking ability is much higher. Your risk, your appetite to do things innovatively out of the box is much higher. And I think that's, that's what really helped me. The third thing uh, that, that really helped me is the approach to problem solving. And I think that generally women are much more astute at problem solving than, than men are. Of course, no offense, uh, no offenses. Um, right. Uh, and I think that as, as a woman, you are much better at putting yourself in the shoes of people in a household. You are much better at looking at things from a people's vantage point. So whenever I would sit with my operational teams and my operational teams are all men, I would always tell them, and they're all great people and I love working with them, but I would always tell them, but how would, uh, how would a poor woman look at this text message? How would a poor woman go to uh, the class to collect it? So I think as a woman, you have many advantages in terms of your ability to multitask, your ability to risk take, your ability to go be, you know, to be more people centric. And in any case, when in a very male dominated culture, when you get to a decision making role and when you get to the role of being at, at a crisis table as the only woman, you obviously have certain things under your belt in terms of, in terms of experience, in terms of risk taking. But if I have a minute more, I will take you to, you know, to, 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 and put you in the shoes of a woman, a poor woman in the community, not women like us who are privileged uh, by virtue of our backgrounds. Uh, as I was rolling out cash to half my country, uh, I had the privilege of being in the field a lot and interacting with, with men and women who were in cash queues to, to get cash. And I would ask, typically I would ask uh, them a set of questions. 
why are you here what will you use this cash for uh, how critical it is for you and consistently it was women in the queues who would say my children need to be fed mm -hmm. i need to buy medicine so so so, uh, so i think that that decision making difference between men and women is not that that critical difference is not just for women like us it's also for for women across across the board so, permit me to come in permit me to come in on this because all of you have made the point uh, that there is something gendered in terms of whether it's a capacity for multitasking whether it's a capacity for empathy for compassion what i want to ask all of you is where does this leave the woman herself with so much emphasis on caregiving with so much emphasis on providing for the family before yourself with so much emphasis on making sure the children eat before you do in moments of crisis is it that we sometimes forget to prioritize ourselves and is that necessarily a good thing i know i'm asking a controversial or maybe even a contrarian question here but i sometimes like to say to women that the problem with us is that we hesitate to be selfish and maybe maybe we should be encouraged to be a little selfish sometimes and i just want to put that out there for a brief set of responses because we have very limited time and there's so much to talk about i'll start with you punam and then uh, to shireen and then to suraya uh, are we to sacrificing is that a problem actually of being women and the way we're shaped and formed to be very honest merka and to answer your question honestly i do think that is correct that is what happens and i think that happens part of it could be cultural part of it could be the way we are brought up and we come from a part of the world where we grow up like that we see our mothers our grandmothers everybody making sacrifices uh you know for you for the kids um it does happen that when we are looking at different interests uh we tend to put ourselves into the background and i'm not only talking of families i'm talking of office interests too because yes. you're really grappling with a lot you're looking at a huge amount of work in office as was just said shared by sanya and all of us are really in that situation we are we are grappling with a lot of work and sometimes i compare myself with my husband and i tell him all the time that all you're worried about is your golf in the morning your lunch and then you know you sort of your drink in the evening and look at us i'm we get up at 6 and i'm thinking of what to get cooked for lunch before i come to office when i come to office what is all that i have to do it's really a full plate and then by the time you get back you're very exhausted and yet there are a lot of demands on you you get used to them over time but you do neglect yourself i cannot just uh, agree more with you that we do put ourselves in the background uh sometimes we do realize that we pay a heavy price for it also yes but that's yes. where you made i think and but is that is that a good thing because you know mental health is something we should be talking about tells you in our part of the world uh, and i'll take this back to the panel maybe i can bring in uh, shireen sharmin choudhury on this uh, mental health women are much more depressed than men uh, all scientific studies show you dr sharmin that women internalize more picking up on the same thing that dr punam khetpal just illustrated that we put our own interests at the back now share something personal with us you know uh, this grappling and juggling and balancing of work and home this is a this is a problem for women this is not a problem for men and i was saying earlier in the day that till there is equality at home there cannot be equality at work we will not be free to make the policies we want to we will not be free to immerse ourselves completely passionately at work till we have somebody carrying 50% of the load at home otherwise we're just under too much pressure true um let me just uh, very briefly uh, touch in um, give you a few examples before i go into addressing your uh, this present question i just want to give a few examples of uh, the issue that it's not only the that women bring in empathy but women also have the trait to address very detailed issues because you know as mm -hmm. caregivers and homemakers 
a woman is also responsible to manage the budgeting of her own house. So often we think that women are not, they don't have the skills of a financial background or any accountant uh, ability, but they are actually managing the resources uh, of their own families and how they're budgeting. So that skill they also bring as policy makers. And when they are addressing the uh, issue uh, in the healthcare system, you know, in the healthcare, even if the services are available, but because of the social setting, women and girls are often, uh, you know, they don't, they do delay in seeking healthcare because of certain obstacles that they face and they don't want to overcome that. Then there is poor access to healthcare for girls and women. These are issues. So when a women leader you know, wants to make a policy, they often look into all these small nitty gritty details, which also require resource allocation for these women to overcome these problems mm -hmm. and uh, access the healthcare that is available. So for maternal health voucher scheme, they often pack it with a travel voucher, with a small funding for them to travel to the health service center. So this is one example of the detail that women address. Um, then the other thing is, you know, the maternal, um, um, during pregnancy, the maternity leave, our Honorable Prime Minister Sheikh Hasina, she has made the maternity leave six months with pay in the government sector for women, because this is a special health situation when a woman is pregnant. So these are the special provisions that a women leader thinks about in making policies. So I just wanted to give you... But can we bring can we no, bring a little bit of you you the person into this conversation? You have told us about Bangladesh, yes. and Bangladesh has had a very successful record, more so than any country in South Asia in closing the gender gap. And I grant uh, grant you that, and thank you for sharing those details. But a little bit about not Shireen, the speaker of the parliament, but Shireen, the woman, Shireen, the person. What has been your yes. struggle to reach this place that you're at? Thank you. I think uh, the the question was that uh, we women don't often uh, pay any uh, pay much attention to our own needs, and uh, we are always busy uh, catering to the needs of others. But I think this is something that generates out of the social setting in which we are groomed and uh, we are brought up, and uh, it has a lot to do with the structural the cultural and uh, the socioeconomic pattern, uh, because it is a general expectation that this is what a woman needs to do. It's a perception issue. It's also sometimes a stereotype expectation. But you know, as things are changing, uh, we have heard that, yes, we, have may, we may have seen our mothers doing it or our grandmothers doing it, but now the world has changed a lot and now women are also working and working women uh, need a lot of support in addition to uh, her own educational qualification and all that. But right. we as women, we have a major responsibility as a mother. And I think that for every woman, that is a huge priority issue. So maybe you have a very important meeting uh, this morning in your office, or maybe as a uh, lawyer, when I was in practicing in the Supreme Court, I have a very urgent case but my daughter has a very high fever and i can't you know leave her behind nor can i miss the being there in my workplace so these are the dilemmas which a, a working woman faces and it's quite different from a male person second when you know after a long day of work uh, you had a lot of issues challenges it was a stressful day you come back home and your uh, mate who takes care of your child throughout the day thinks that, okay, now she is back, so I'm off. And she just, you know, gives the child to you and, and it's your child at the end of the day. So, of course, you are the mother and you are back home. So, you have to put behind all the stress that you have gone through. You were not on a trip or you were not, you know, out on a thing, work, uh, yeah. very serious work. But... That doesn't matter. Yeah. And then you confront that this thing is not there. The rice was not brought. So, you know, you didn't send anybody to the market to this morning. You forgot about it. So now we don't have this. They're coming and telling you. Yeah. And no, no, I think I totally you know. Yeah. Balance. Yeah, I totally know. I think across. 
And we have women from across four different countries, India, Pakistan, Bangladesh, uh, and Afghanistan at this point, but this would pretty much count as a universal experience. So let me take that back to the panel. You know, we're here to talk about how policy could be different. And of course, the personal, the personal is the political. So I want to take this a little more because we have about 10 to 15 minutes left. And what I want to do is get specific. You know, uh, beyond the we are multitaskers, we are more compassionate and life is much tougher for women. And I again and again want to underline that without equality at home, we are never going to have equality at work. Uh, so maybe we should be careful before we take on so much at home and ask uh, the men at home also to do their bit. Uh, Dr. Suraya, uh, structurally, Afghanistan's a completely different space because it is emerging from the shadows of violent conflict. You mentioned in your last comments the bombing of a maternity hospital. You mentioned the paucity of female doctors. There's religious orthodoxy. There's a kind of less than um, sort of dimension to, to, to female health care. Can you, can you speak to what the urgent, most urgent crisis is? And that if you were making policy as a woman, what's the one thing you change? about the policies you have to deal with. OK, thank you. Uh, very interesting discussion. Uh, I think what, what is important for us to overcome the situation uh, gradually is that to have gender inclusive approaches. And the gender equality and gender equity agenda, we should integrate men. We should integrate boys. We should integrate fathers, husbands, and brothers, and sons, and so on. And I think that's so important because that in order to create that space for us, we need to do it along the along the uh, the, the continuum at the household, at the workplace, at the community, and of course at the governance and policy making uh, level. It cannot go in isolation. And I think we as women and, and uh, as mothers have a critical role and a fundamental role in doing that because the way we raise our children, the way we raise our sons and girls and daughters are so important in shaping the future. In my country, men, uh, boys at the very early stage they are trained that they are superior, that they have mm -hmm. advantages by their biological creation uh, and, and so on. And the, the, their privileges start at the household le level with regards to their relationship with their sisters, re relationship with their uh, mother and so on. And that expands when they go to school, that expands when they go to workplace. And over time, over years, then they become part of their value system, that they are created superior, that women are inferior and they are to be submissive and to yeah. be at their service. We also have as mothers responsibility to empower our girls and, and raise our daughters in a way that they Thing, behave in a different way. I'm saying this because I have three daughters and I want them to be strong. I, I want them to speak for themselves. I want them to understand and to recognize that kind of behavior, that kind of look at them when they are looked at differently, when they are expected yeah. differently because of their sex. So um, th this is one thing. Another thing that I want to bring into this panel is that I recognize when I was minister in my country a few years ago was that we women need to connect better with each other, that we need to have a sense of belonging net network, a network of mutual support and forming purposeful partnerships. And I must admit that men are extremely good and well prepared at this compared to women. We are not good. I was not good at, in that when I uh, when I was um, in, in the in, in the positions in the government a few years ago. And I think that is because probably again we are raised that way because we see ourselves as few women and so on. 
And I think it's so yeah. important for us to connect and to have that support system among us um, to support each other. I'm so glad you brought up the support system because I actually think that something we haven't spoken about, and maybe maybe uh, I can take that to Sanya if we can uh, take this to her, is, you know, I'm starting to get audience questions on my phone. and. But one of the things, and, and I've been mentioning it again and again, is equality at home. I'm just wondering how many of, of, of you in your personal spaces uh, have looked to the, to the men uh, in, your, in your lives and asked them. I think Puna mentioned that, that I, te I tell my husband, hey, you better do your share. You better pull your weight too. Uh, how many of you have had to or wanted to do that? Uh, or, or how many of you have just resigned yourself to the fact that you're going to have to carry uh, most of the burden of both work and home. Um, Dr. Sanya, if I may take that to you and then maybe Poonam can add to it and then a round of last questions. Yeah. Well, well I think that we're talking about two separate things here. Um, I mean, are you supported to pursue your career at home? Is, is your husband supported? Is your mother-in-law supportive? Is one, is one thing. But sharing the burden at home in terms of housekeeping, in terms of responsibilities, is, is, is a different matter. So if I can tell you from my personal experience, my, my husband is extremely supportive. Uh, I did all my post-grad education. Uh, after I got married, and my husband was very supportive. He, uh, whenever I had my exams, we would go together. And uh, my mother-in-law was extremely supportive because had it not been for her support, I don't think I would I could have carried on my studies. And you have to understand our our culture, our South Asian culture, where we live in joint families, where we have very complex interdependencies. Um, and my mother was mother-in-law was really the backbone. Uh, that, that helped me pursue a very aggressive professional career. My kids were small and I went for months on end to pursue my postgraduate studies. She would handle things back at home, look after my children, make sure when my husband had a bad mood, she handled him and, and the rest of it. Um, and I think that was that, that is very crucially important. Otherwise, I, I just could not complete my studies. I was very young when I got married. I had to do, I had to go and uh, complete my clinical work, take my membership exams, enroll in a PhD, do, do the postdoc, et cetera, et cetera. But once, you're, once you've done your studies and, uh, and just to close the loop on this, even when yeah. I was working in global health, and as Poonam will tell you, in global health, you have to be outside of your house for at least four times a month. You have to travel internationally, at least in pre-COVID days we used to. And even during that time, he was extremely supportive. I was on an aggressive campaign to be WHO DG for two years and I got a lot of support from home. But then this is different from uh, from sharing housework. So, so, you know, even in this role, I have to be the traditional housewife. So I have to entertain and to make sure that uh, the checklist of 11 things are done every morning when I come. Uh, and this is not unique to South Asia or to the developing world or to our cultures. This is, this is global. So whenever I yeah. prepare notes with, with colleagues anywhere, they explain the same thing to, to me. Uh, and I think what you said was very profound because you said that unless there is equality at home, there cannot be equality uh, at, at the workspace. I think you you hit the nail uh, you hit the nail on its head with that just with that one statement. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you for being candid, uh, Punam. You want to add to that, and then I literally have time for closing comments. Uh, you know, to, because I think you opened it very candidly uh, with saying it's exasperating sometimes, and uh, to see men not doing their share of the work, even while being supportive. Otherwise, as Sanya so uh, candidly also shared, uh, and you know that's why you have now. Uh, organizations like the Gates Foundation, for example, quite radically talk about family leave, not maternity leave and not paternity leave, but pushing the envelope on gender ascribed roles, pushing the envelope on who's responsible for parenting, who's responsible for housework, to stop the romanticism in a way around this so that it falls, the work falls only on one gender. 
think that's right. Actually, what you said and what Sanya said, that men may be very encouraging when you're doing things and uh, they may have a very kind of a progressive, let's say, outlook as far as uh, women are concerned. When, but when it really comes to the practice of it and when it comes to really doing things, the expectations are high. The expectations as far as the families are concerned, as far as children are concerned, as far as socializing is concerned, all this are high. And one is expected to do a lot of things which you may not really want to do, or you may not, it may not be a high priority for you, especially socializing. But um, these are things that you know you're expected yeah. to do, and you do very often at your discomfort. Yeah. And you go along yeah. with it. However, I would like to mention three things. I think that we've been talking about this uh, now, Varka, and I feel what's very important is for women to empower themselves. I think we don't do that. I think very often we fall in line with what is expected of us. And I think we have to be a little more assertive about what really should be done in different settings, be it a home setting, an office setting. Office setting, I always find is much easier because what you say is done very often. And you, you did mention, yes, it's a struggle very often in a men's environment. But as Sanya said, I was also used to a situation where I was very often the only woman among many men. And therefore, you get used to that. And I don't find the office situation a challenge at all. I feel the problem is when you're trying to balance various roles, your domestic role, your mother's role, your wife's role, you know, a grand, um, whatever, your in-laws there, whatever, the relative's expectation, that is where the problem arises. And when you're trying to really balance all that, and it comes to you. So I think it's very important for women to really be a little more assertive about what they want to do and what they don't want to do, uh, because ultimately it is they who would suffer. I also feel that they should try to change attitudes and behaviors, which they can. And somebody mentioned how when it's not just women. I mean, you're, if you have a son, you need to also educate the son on this. So that when the next generation comes, they're more aware of these kind of responsibilities. Because as we see, women in the workforce mm -hmm. are increasing. They are getting equal education. They have equal aspirations. They also want to do well. But that acceptability has to be there. And that encouragement has to be there uh, in practice and not just you know by word of mouth. And then I feel somehow um, we have to level the power equation. We have to just level it. And that is something which will take time, but it will happen and it is happening. If we compare ourselves with what happened uh, generations ago, obviously there's an improvement, but it doesn't mean that we've reached where we should reach. There are, there's a lot that we need to cover and we need to be conscious of that. I, I, I completely agree with what you've said about the need for self-assertion. Now, uh, taking this back to the panel, we have about five minutes left. I've got a bunch of audience questions. I'm just going to read through them and I'll give all of you a minute to, to make closing comments. Uh, so the questions, um, I'm curious to know whether any of the women leaders in the panel when faced with conflict between work and home have turned to their male partners. I think you answered that. How can we avoid tokenism in policy making? This is a great question. How do you go beyond tokenism? How do the conversations about health care, especially when it comes to women, go beyond maternal and child health? And how can we as women make sure we don't raise the next generation with inequity? How can we stop? How can we stop being part of the sort of perpetuating, self-perpetuating problem? So these are closing comments. It's uh, we have literally five minutes i'll give you all a minute to make your closing comments uh, i'll start with you uh, sanya if i may dr sanya nishtar from pakistan so i'll just pick the question uh, pick on the question about avoidance of tokenism and policy making i think that's a very important question because a lot of times we see uh, that in policy formulation it's very easy to say well that we we are gender neutral 50 percent of the benefits are for women, but when the rubber hits the road, that is not the case. And I think uh, in terms of answering the question, how to avoid data is a very important tool. 
I'll give you an example in uh, in the program that I run. It's a very large social protection program, multifaceted, ma many components. We have a 50% plus rule. At least 50% of the benefits have to go to women, and we actually track it. So when a particular stream of work slips down 45%, 43%, we raise an alert, you make sure that it's actually delivered, you make resources conditional on, on, on delivery of that particular target. Uh, more broadly, in terms of uh, my last comment, and, and thank you for, for, this, for, for the wonderful moderation, I think we need institutional approaches to furthering uh, the participation of women in, in, the, in the workplace, in, in addition to the profound point that you made earlier and which I, uh, which I echoed very strongly. I think we need institutional approaches, you know, and, and I think one of the most important institutional approaches is, is mentoring. Uh, uh, yeah. men, men, men have an, an, an unnamed club. So when you see four men around the table, it's natural for them to support each other. And I think that we need to develop a structured uh, mechanism for, for older women, more experienced women to, to help mentor the younger ones who are trying to find their place. Uh, I, I think Absolutely. I just leave it at that. Thank you, Dr. Sanya The boys, the great boys club, uh, as we call it. I think we've all seen it in our work uh, workspaces. Dr. Suraya, if I may give you a minute to your for your closing comment. Thank you, uh, Borja. Uh, I want to um, continue on a few things. First, uh, institutional approaches, and we need strong institutions. In my country, for sure, strong institutions, especially in terms of social services that includes education and healthcare, justice-related institution for law enforcement, and then security institution to ensure security. And I think this is part of the three triangle that create that space and ecosystem for women to succeed and to rise. Um, second, uh, women in data. In order for us to go beyond policy and, and um, those frameworks, it's important to be women, girls, reflected in the data, and we have disaggregated data. You brought the, the questions about COVID-19 women and men in Afghanistan because you had the data and you had, you, you, you had that information. Yes. So we need that information. Yes. We need that information not only with regards to healthcare, but with regards to social policies, um, net, uh, support systems, uh, and so on. Mentorship um, is key. We have a greater role than our authority and our formal rules, and that's mentorship. And I have seen it in my life that mentorship being that um, guide uh, and moral support to other young girls, to other young women is important. Is, is key, in fact. Um, Self-awareness for women, uh, being self-aware, and, um, and, and, and that right. is where your courage comes um, to demand uh, for responsibility and to share that responsibility. I think, I think you, you said, much. I think you said, Soraya, uh, somewhere do one thing every day that you're scared of. Because you mentioned courage. I think you said, to all women everywhere, do one thing every day that you're scared of or that someone stopped you from doing. And I think that's a great thing uh, to remember. Dr. Poonam, if I can uh, come to you, Poonam Ketripal Singh, uh, for, for, for your last take. One minute, please. Thank you. Yes, I do think that there's tokenism in policymaking. I do feel that when there is policymaking about women, let's go back to the Beijing conference now, it's 25 years. What are we really seeing which is you know, which we wanted to see in 25 years. Yes, there will be progress, there always is, but is it what we expected? Secondly, I think when we are looking at policy and when we are making work plans, we are really looking at outputs. We are not going to outcomes. We are not going to impact because that is what is the difficult thing to measure. And as has been mentioned, we do lack disaggregated data. We do not have it, especially in certain parts of the world, it is missing. Therefore, it is very difficult really to see what is the impact of all this. But looking around and just going by what we perceive, we do find that the progress is slow. It is not what we thought or those who attended the Baking Conference expected it to be. Therefore, 
it is time for us to get together and to think. And as was mentioned, I totally subscribe to the view of the Boys Club. It is there. We do find yeah. that everywhere. It is, yeah. we cannot wish it away. It will always be there. And therefore, perhaps women need to get sensitized to that and to see that rather than look for acceptability there, which some women do get. Yeah. However, why can we not have those kind of clubs, as was mentioned by Suraya, I think, pointed yeah. it out. So I do think yeah. we have to think of some positive things which will make a difference. And once we yeah, analyze absolutely. this, that's important. Yeah. That's the way ahead. Uh, Dr. Shireen, uh, I'll give you I'll give you the last word. Uh, Dr. Shireen Sharmin Chaudhry, the Speaker of the Bangladesh uh, Parliament, uh, and with the data point, since all three previous speakers have emphasized the importance of data, women hold only seven percent of ministerial positions and fifteen percent in national parliaments across South Asia. Do you believe more women in politics, uh, more women in government, more women in our parliaments would change the conversation? Absolutely. I couldn't agree more. We definitely need more women representation in every sphere and in every tier, in parliaments and in all the other decision making bodies and institutions and in the entire decision making process, the voices of the women will have to be made, you know, they have to be allowed to be heard more. And that can only happen through more representation. And they, if they are in those positions, then they can bring about positive differences. They can make the necessary changes that are required. And then policy will not be just merely a tokenism, but it will be, I believe, that every opportunity must be made available for girls and women and uh, on equal terms and sometimes even more because we are lagging behind and we know that there are goals uh, like uh, planet 5050 we are aspiring to uh, you know moving towards that which is um, the declared by united nations so we have to keep in view that uh, what what is it that we want to uh, achieve at the end of the day and it has to be uh, more uh, women everywhere and uh, also the institutional support is very important. And in terms of institutional support, I would say that in bringing about the changes um, in, the, uh, in the stereotype pattern of women having to do everything, um, they, yes. when they are, we see that women are into very serious professions nowadays, which require a lot of demand on time. Uh, so they, uh, you know, there should be more flexible hours for women uh, in the office. If they, there should be policies which allow them to enjoy flexible hours that eight hours they will work, but they can, you know, do it according to their own need. And there, there can be, you know, more um, uh, this childcare support centers, even within their working premises. Right. So these are the institutional supports which are extremely necessary, not only your own family, supporting you, your spouse, supporting you at home, which is absolutely critical. But in addition to that, we must also reach out to the institutional supports and those measures must also be um, adopted. And just one final point is that we have to engage men and boys in all of these conversations that we are having to bring about the desired change. Thank you. I, I completely agree and I hope many men are already tuned into this conversation and I think the point was also made earlier about how we bring up our boys is critical, how you school them, the colors you paint in their uh, their classrooms, the activities that you make them do at both school and home and I think again and again we underestimate the importance of this role playing uh, that women so unthinkingly sometimes embrace at home and then that is passed down to their children. I'm going to say thank you now to this extraordinary panel, all very, very powerful women who will forgive me for not standing on protocol today and pushing you to share something personal because I think there are many, many platforms where we know you as leaders. I think the attempt today was to know you as people for many women across the world uh, to, to be able to universalize 
uh, you know, their experience listening from you and to derive inspiration from the fact that if even powerhouses like you have had to battle, then their struggles are also worth it. So uh, if I wasn't very official uh, or officious, I'm sorry for that, but I do think that we wanted to be inspired by all of you. And that's why my particular line of uh, questioning. Thank you, Dr. Shireen Sharmin Chaudhary, Suraya Dalil, Sanya Nishtar, Poonam Khetrapal Singh. A pleasure talking to all of you. I hope you were... Uh, our audience was as inspired from them uh, as I was. They were also extremely honest, uh, extremely candid about sharing little nuggets about their personal spaces. And as we all know, personal is uh, is political. Uh, we are, uh, you know, going to leave you with one sobering statistic. Uh, you know, less women in India are working than before. I don't know what the data is on the other countries, but I can share with you, that because this is something I've researched, that 20 million Indian women actually left the workforce over the past decade, and the female labor force participation in India is actually declining. That is the so sobering statistic. But the image on your screen is the inspiring image. Uh, these are women from our part of the world. This is our culture. In our culture, with all its orthodoxy, with all its barriers, with all its inequities, it is possible to rise to the very top, as the four women on our screen represent. Uh, so please do learn from them. Please do, do join us tomorrow. Tomorrow, the focus will be on Africa. Some very special guests lined up, including the First Lady of Namibia, the head of UNAIDS, a Kenyan rapper, uh, all kinds of things in store. And in the meantime, I'll say goodbye to my panel and to all of you. Thank you. It's been a pleasure and an honor to moderate the fourth annual Women in, uh, Global Leaders in Health Conference, and I hope you enjoyed it as much as I do. Thank you for watching, and goodbye.